So I want to say thank you so much for a great turnout this morning. I'm really surprised. Uh, not surprised because of the, the, the subject that we have on floating wind, which takes a lot of interest, but you've, some people get the third day corp, you know, so conference burnout and, um, and they're sort of desperate and thinking about other things. But I really appreciate you turning up and, uh, and opening up for a good discussion today. Um, hopefully you've also, uh, you're either sitting on one of these or you have it in your hand. So the latest from Wind Europe, floating offshore wind vision statement. Please do read this. It's an important piece of work that uh, has been done by Wind Europe and, and many of the partners uh, involved in this, where we can actually see uh, a wider development for floating wind and particularly some of the policy direction that needs to be had if we're going to get the deployment necessary for floating wind in Europe. So please have a look at that one. Some of the, uh, the interesting elements about floating wind is that there are so many different concepts out there and, uh, and the deployment is, is one of the issues that we're working towards in particular. So this document speaks very much to that. Just wanted to start to introduce the panel we have today. We've got a great panel of um, experts within uh, the industry itself. We have Ola Stolber, who's from Ideal Offshore Wind. We have Sabrinka Dunkelmann, who's from Mekal. We have Jesper Möller from Siemens and Sebastian Bringsvad from Statoil. The presentations today will be about 12 minutes that we'll run through conceptually, and then we'd like to have some time for interactive Q&A afterwards. And the, the panel has promised to keep their answers short and concise. So we're actually to have an interactive session for as many questions as possible. So please be ready for that yourselves. Let's uh, not waste any more time. Thanks for everyone more coming in at the back. Obviously, this is the most popular session today. So I'll just kick off with Ola with the first presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, uh, for the kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. It's my task to um, start a hard day um, after two hard days of networking. So it'll be my task to sort of try and, and motivate everybody to um, have a look at floating wind. Um, the title of my presentation is Go Where the Wind Blows. Um, and this is aiming at uh, comparing um, uh, situations or scenarios where we can see that there is a benefit, uh, a commercial tangible benefit for floating wind. <clears throat> uh, but I'll have to introduce myself and my company first, that's Ideol. Um, who are we? Um, I'll give a brief introduction for anyone who hasn't uh, had that before on the floating concepts that there are. Um, then I'll <clears throat> come to the core of, of what I want to tell, and that's the business case and the scenarios. And uh, finally, um, a little remark over um, what size gives in terms of benefits, but also in, in terms of uh, potential challenges. Uh, we're an engineering and technology developer, uh, and we are specialized in floating substructures. That's the only thing we do, and we do it very well. Uh, we've been founded in 2010, we are now 60 employees, <clears throat> and we have developed a number of patents. The most important of those is the damping pool, uh, which is unique to our concept. Um, we have a line of, of projects coming up. We have the flow chain demonstrator under construction in France that will be going into the water before the end of the year <clears throat> with a two megawatt turbine, excuse me. <coughs> Then uh, we have a demonstrator coming up uh, in Japan. We have done two designs for that in a cooperation with Hitachi Tsusen, uh, Maribeni, and the University of Tokyo under the MINDOV program. Um, we have uh, one design and engineering contract with China Steel Construction for a project in Taiwan that was supposed to be commissioned in 2019. Uh, here's a picture of the flow chain demonstrator that's about two weeks old. Uh, the decks are now in place. Um, next thing we have on the map is uh, the AOMED project, a project of four Senvion 6.2 megawatt uh, turbines in the Mediterranean, in a consortium with developer Quadran, uh, civil construction uh, specialist, Buick Travaux Public, and of course Senvion as the wind turbine supplier. Um, then we have two cooperations with project developers. Um, uh, one is with Atlantis for the UK and one with Gay Electric in Ireland. Both are aiming to build um, um, gigawatt scale offshore wind farms uh, 
and uh, before they want to do that, they want to do pre-commercial phases, um, 100 megawatt in the UK and about 30 megawatt in Ireland. Uh, the technology overview, uh, there's lots of concepts, but you can break them down in, in four main um, systems. And uh, the first one to your left is uh, the barge, uh, which is um, the shape of our concept, um, the semi-submersible, um, the spar, uh, and the tension leg platform. <clears throat> I won't go through the details, so anyone who wants to discuss that later on, I'm happy to do that. What I would like to show, however, is um, a small comparison. We have done um, drawings for uh, the same size of turbine with all the different concepts. And when you see uh, our concept uh, in comparison to the other concepts, you can see that we have the unique benefit of being very compact and that we can work with a rather shallow draft. Um, I won't go through this because I only have 12 minutes, um, but uh, basically what this says is <clears throat> um, that there, every concept has unique benefits and um, challenges and needs um, certain infrastructure. Um, ours can be built on the key side, ours is very compact, and ours is uh, providing the most amount of local content in the construction. Um, that's the bottom line of that. And for anyone who doubts that uh, floating wind is happening, you can see uh, I've just done an overview of a timeline with, with all the projects. And you can see towards the right, uh, 2019, 2020, 2021, it's getting fairly congested on my uh, diagram. Uh, and there's probably even more coming up, um, which means it's actually happening. It's being realized in the water. Right, I'll come to the commercial habitat of floating offshore wind. Um, <clears throat> uh, and when I do my scenario comparisons, I have to compare, uh, I can't really compare like with like because uh, it's different times, it's different um, uh, technologies. Uh, so I have to make a number of assumptions. Um, first of all, my assumption is that the easy sites are going to become less. The near shore sites with shallow water um, and, and easy soil uh, are just going to become less because there's so much other constraints in the water. Um, what I would like to make clear as well is that floating does not compare with, uh, compete with um, bottom fixed substructures. Uh, both have their uh, environments and habitats and um, so therefore there's no reason to, to really compete. Um, what we do is we go into the areas with, with better wind resource. We are not constrained by soil conditions or water depth. We just go where the best wind resource is. Um, <clears throat> wind turbines and projects become bigger. Economies of scale are necessary to drive down the cost, uh, as we see, and as, as is necessary to make this uh, commercially viable. Um, wind turbines and balance of plants uh, will increase in design life. Um, that's already a visible fact. Uh, turbines are moving up from 20 to 25 to 30 years uh, design lifetime. And that is a very strong driver in driving down, getting down the generation cost. Uh, and as a conclusion, basically, uh, we have to say that CapEx is not the measure to which we can compare projects or um, uh, um, the commercial viability of floating or bottom fixed. Uh, we have to look at the LCOE. I will do that uh, in a qualitative manner. So anyone who expects to see at the end uh, that we can generate at five cents or three cents or whatever per kilowatt hour uh, will be very disappointed. Um, uh, but there is so many uncertainties in, in predicting the future that we can't just do that. Um, so it's going to be qualitative. qualitative. But I think <clears throat> you'll get a lot of learning out of that as well. So the scenarios we compare or I compared is um, a 2020 uh, uh, commercial bottom fixed offshore wind farm with 8 megawatt turbines, 400 megawatts, so 50 units, 25 years design lifetime. And 2024, um, a floating array with 12 megawatt turbines, 600 megawatts, um, 50 units again, but 30 years design life. And um, what we also assume that turbines decrease in cost because of the increase in scale, and that's a rather <clears throat> conservative approach to have 3.5% uh, decrease per annum. So I looked at 
two scenarios, one in France and one in Scotland. This one, um, there's two sites on the east of Scotland, uh, one with a uh, shallow, well, it's not exactly shallow, but um, it's around 40 meters, um, seabed depth, and um, another site uh, which is at greater water depth, around 90 meters. Um, the same sites here on a wind resource map show you that uh, the one on, in shallow water has only 8.6 to 9 meters per second at 100 meter LAT. Um, and this offers 30 kilometer export cable. Uh, the other scenario is in 90 meters water depth and uh, oh, 50 to 150 meters, so it's fairly variable. <clears throat> But the wind resource is much better because uh, you're in a place uh, where the wind is strong, not where the water is shallow. And um, so you have there uh, 10 to 10.5 meters per second. Uh, when you compare uh, the net um, capacity factors of the two projects, um, you see that you have 27.4% 20 almost, 28% uh, uh, more wind that you can harvest, more electricity that you can harvest. Um, when you look at the capex, of course, the bigger project is more expensive. <clears throat> and um, what you can also see, uh, I've compared uh, the percentages of the capex assumptions I've made, and um, you can see that we reduce the cost of installation because we can do it key side and we bring the turbine to the side. That's a good factor. Uh, the foundations are more expensive because uh, of complications with moorings and things like that, but we can compensate that. Now, um, if we look at the LCOE, <clears throat> uh, I put all that into a financial, very rough and ready uh, financial model, and I'm only an engineer, um, but it's, it's fairly straightforward to do that. And I come to the conclusion that uh, the scenario B would have an LCOE, which is 28.8% lower than uh, scenario A. In France, um, we have made a selection of two sites, one on the Atlantic coast and one in the Mediterranean. And when you look at the wind resource map, uh, you see, surprisingly, that there is very much wind in a particular area of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean in front of uh, the Golf de Lyon. <coughs> and um, that offers 10 to 10.5 meters per second, uh, whereas the Atlantic coast has something in the order of 8 meters per second average wind speed at 100 meters. If we look at the capacity factors, the difference is even bigger here. Um, you have almost 30% more <coughs> yield, uh, better capa capacity factor per unit. Um, if we look at the capex, um, you have a similar picture. Um, the project is far more expensive, very obviously. Um, but when you look at the LCOE, that brings down the cost of electricity generation by 24% compared to uh, the first scenario. I'm running out of time. I'm skipping this. But my last message is what I've done in half a, year, half a day's worth of research in the internet. I compiled a list of vessels, installation vessels, <clears throat> and I compared that to the assumptions we make how big uh, 12 megawatt and 15 megawatt turbines would be. And you see in red um, where the vessels don't quite meet um, the necessities to bring a very heavy nacelle up to a very high tower. Either you have a very strong crane or you have um, not a very high reach um, and uh, which doesn't have a very high reach, or you have a high-reaching crane that doesn't have quite the capacity. Um, for 12 megawatts, you see that there is very few vessels which can cope with this task. And if you look at the 15 megawatt scenario, <clears throat> you can see that virtually all the hook heights are, are red. So there is, a, uh, at the moment, uh, a shortage of vessels that can do these jobs. And the solution is that um, we should use floating wind to um, enable and make it cheaper to build larger turbines, bring down the cost. Okay, that's the end of it. Um, I have a little video, but we can skip that. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I have the honor to present you today the Telvent floating concept. 
So I will first give you some background information about uh, Tailwind and our company. Then I will move on to a more specific design of uh, Tailwind. I will explain you how we have uh, proved the concept in a fully coupled model and in tank tests. And then uh, give a short outlook in uh, what it uh, brings for cost of energy and uh, what the next steps are. So uh, Tailwind is a project um, found, um, supported by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 um, project program. Um, and it is um, developed by a consortium of eight partners with uh, a lot of different expertise which we bring into the project um, from uh, hydrodynamic uh, expertise, civil engineering and wind turbine design. Um, Mekite's um, task in this project is to bring in the knowledge of uh, the wind turbine de design to, have, uh, to follow the integrated approach uh, we have experience in, uh, in technology development uh, since 1985, uh, doing uh, turbine design, system integration, component design, simulation and analysis. Uh, we have, um, for example, been uh, also involved in the development of the Aliade turbine. Um, Mekal is uh, also supporting operators and owners in asset management and uh, we um, serve uh, consultancy services to on and offshore. Our mission is to uh, further reduce cost of energy and this has been done uh, by Mekal with the conceptual design of a 12 megawatt turbine which was honored by uh, Wind Power Monthly as in uh, the wind innovations of, uh, the in the top fives in 2013. Uh, we have developed an installation and transportation system for a TLP platform and now we cooperate um, in the research project Tailwind. So the Tailwind uh, concept is um, an evolved spa configuration with a suspended uh, ballast tank. So you can uh, see here the upper tank and the lower tank. Um, which are connected via tendons and then connected to the seabed via mooring lines. And then it is uh, combined with a telescopic tower, um, which is uh, self-erecting two sections of uh, concrete and an upper section of steel. And when, uh, when we have uh, first heard about the telescopic tower, we thought, wow, what a crazy idea. They must be stupid, but now, they have already proven uh, the concept and it, it is an innovative idea. Um, there are still some challenges, but uh, yeah, we will see that uh, it really has a good, uh, good opportunity and will lead to success when, uh, when looking at the uh, cost of energy. So uh, how can we reduce uh, the cost? By high really reduce uh, material usage and uh, using uh, concrete at lo as low cost material and with a simple and reliable manufacturing and installation process which can be done uh, onshore. So the Tailwind combines advantages of uh, different state-of-the-art floating concepts. Um, as Ole has already presented, um, we can use the, um, the advantage of material usage of the TLP, have um, the advantages of installation um, process of the semi-submersible. We are um, not sensible to, to waves and the concept um, is very stable. We have a, a low draft range, so uh, it is uh, not required that the harbor is uh, as deep as it should be for a spa boy. Um, we are less dependent on soil condition and it uh, has a great uh, opportunity for industrialization. So the goal is to maintain uh, low draft and uh, low height 
uh, and low with and uh, working condition um, to ensure full independency of uh, costly offshore installation vessels and to use the onshore cranes which are available. Um, we allow for direct scalability to 10 plus megawatt turbines. Um, the, the goal is to have uh, high floating stability and to um, and with a goal to not increase the loads on the turbine. And this is also combined with a controller which we will develop in the project so uh, that we can guarantee that loads on the, on the turbine will not increase. And uh, all in all, we will provide a cost reduction uh, with the installed substructure. So uh, some background information I, uh, um, on, on the design. Um, the first prototype uh, will be planned with a five megawatt turbine. Um, the, the design is uh, made for the Canarian Island uh, and the overall draft is uh, now 60 meter with the upper tank draft of 20.5, uh, uh, lower tank uh, diameter, upper tank diameter of uh, 32 meters. And uh, yeah, I will not uh, go further into details, but uh, you can read it uh, later on. Um, the telescopic tower has al already been uh, installed at, uh, as an onshore prototype. Um, so we see here the uh, lower concrete sections um, and they are jacked up, self-erected um, by hydraulics. And uh, five megawatt turbine is, uh, is running on top. Uh, this uh, prototype was installed in uh, 2014. Uh, regarding to the installation process, so uh, during uh, installation, um, the, upper t uh, the lower tank is not uh, lowered. This will be done at the site, um, and it can be it, it can be uh, transported to the site with a mid-size uh, tugboat. Uh, so no requirements uh, for big offshore vessels. The installation process uh, at the site will be that uh, first the uh, lower tank will be lowered and the uh, tower will be jacked up to the first section. The upper tank will be flooded and uh, which will bring the floater to the end uh, position and then the uh, second section will be lifted. So we have uh, developed a fully coupled model. Um, we are collaborating uh, with um, the institute, the uh, hydrodynamic institute of uh, Cantabria, uh, following two approaches, um, but with a goal to combine a fully, or to have a fully integrated model, um, combining the um, floater dynamics, the mooring dynamics, and the turbine dynamics. Um, Mikal is uh, following this approach with uh, the well-known software Bladed, whereas um, EHC is developing a numerical model with the advantage that we later on can validate uh, the models and can have uh, more detailed um, results for the uh, floater and uh, for, yeah, for the more specific uh, components of the floater. We have uh, performed tank tests at, uh, at the um, Hydrodynamic Institute of uh, Cantabria with a, a goal to prove the fundament fundamentals. Um, we have uh, quantified the hydrodynamic damping we um, have uh, we have um, proven that uh, this, uh, that the system is stable, and we have uh, validated the numerical models, um, which uh, 
led to very good uh, results. So, to give you a short outlook onto uh, CAPEX and OPEX, um, as we have uh, not calculated this uh, based on the site, uh, we have compared it to the uh, IRENA um, study. Um, and as you can see, the Telvin concept is in line with, uh, with IRENA. Um, the first estimation which has been made was uh, done for a prototype. So now the next step will be to, uh, to bring it to a um, larger scale and to calculate it for the wind farm, and we will see that the cost will further go down. So uh, to give you a short outlook on the next steps uh, in this project, we will uh, continue to develop the controller for the wind turbine to make sure that loads will not increase. Uh, we will show the scalability of the concept uh, with a 12 megawatt turbine. Uh, we will prove the installation um, process in a tank test by the end of this year. Um, laboratory fatigue tests of the tendons uh, are planned. And uh, we will continue to, um, to calculate uh, the cost of energy with, uh, on a larger scale. So uh, I think there are a lot of uh, innovative uh, ideas and uh, some, of, uh, some of these ideas might be crazy, but I hope that I have shown you that uh, this one can have uh, success and it really brings uh, costs down for future projects. Thank you very much for your attention. Is it on? Yeah, now it is. Thank you very much for giving me uh, the opportunity to speak a little bit about um, how Siemens is looking at, um, Siemens Gamesa is looking at uh, the challenges for, for offshore wind floaters. Um, I'll give you an insight in, uh, in the direction that we think uh, is important to look at when, when designing floaters and when, uh, when looking at, uh, at projects for floaters. Um, I'll give you a bit of an insight in, in what we see as pros and cons of the different concepts and also a quick view on, on the market potential. First, market um, looks very much similar to what we saw Ole present before. Um, we see a, a centralized effort around uh, France right now with quite a few different demonstration projects being planned in, uh, in France. Um, that's in the so-called, I would say, near future. We see a really big potential in the US, in Hawaii, and in uh, California. And there's also a growing potential in, uh, in Japan, oh, sorry, in Japan, as well as in, uh, in Taiwan. Um, it will take quite a few years until it, it gets um, to a point where we can say that it's a real market. Still an interesting uh, niche market uh, in the coming years. Uh, our efforts in, uh, in wind, um, we are very proud that we were allowed to work with Statoil on the first high wind demo project in Norway in 2009. It's been running very well ever since, I hope, <coughs> or at least what, that's what I heard. <laughs> uh, and we are extremely proud that we are now in the process of erecting the High Wind Scotland project together with Statoil as well. Uh, I think Sebastian will enlighten us a little bit more about that later. <coughs> uh, we are also working on a, a demonstration project in France where we've been selected, pre-selected as turbine provider uh, together with uh, SPM, where uh, SPM will provide the foundation and we provide the turbine and we will do the combined design work together. <coughs> Future markets, uh, we looked at that briefly before, but what is interesting here is maybe that nothing really important happens until we reach 2025, uh, the way we look at it right now. And that's driven by, mainly by the, uh, the potentials in US and the potentials in, uh, in Taiwan. Um, and whether it can happen a little bit before or after 2025 remains to be seen. <clears throat> a 
quick outlook or quick look at the different concepts. Um, we haven't selected any specifics uh, in terms of, of pictures here. It's more the, the different families of, uh, of foundation types where we have some of the pros and cons of the different types. I won't read them all out to you, but we have the semi-sops in the steel, the, the PPI concept installed in, in, um, in Portugal with um, the installation at Keyside, which is valid for, for all concepts uh, that are out there, more or less with one exception maybe. Uh, the cons on that is that it requires active pumping to, uh, to be able to survive. We, are, we tend to look at more uh, stable concepts that don't require any active dampening uh, to survive. Then we have the concrete semi sop which is rather similar to what we uh, saw there. Um, the um, cons on, on the concept that we have looked at here is uh, high cost of concrete elements, and that's, uh, with that I mean simpler elements, smaller elements than, than, uh, than doing it in a, in, in a one-go solution. Uh, it was some, some rather surprising results we saw from analysis and quotes that we were out and asking for, that uh, we were dead sure that smaller cost elements that can be produced in factory-like environments would be much more cost-effective. But so far, it didn't really look like that in the analysis we did. <clears throat> then we have uh, the TLP family. Uh, this is the uh, SPM solution for, uh, for France. Uh, one of the biggest advantages we see with that concept is that it shows a really good industrialization potential. And that not, not just for uh, the TLP concept that looks exactly like this, but any TLP concept, but in fact any concept that resembles an offshore jacket, which you can say that this to some extent does, that all of the hopeful um, gains in savings on offshore jackets can be transferred one-to-one -one onto uh, to TLP systems or lattice structures. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the expectation. I'll show you a little bit more about that later. Then uh, risks on tendons is a classical uh, risk on, on any TLP system. So if a tendon fails and you're sitting in a nacelle, it's fatal. So you have to have a solution where you have double capacity or at least some safety measure so you can accept that a tendon breaks. <clears throat> and that can be done. It's just a matter of, of, uh, of cost. <clears throat> um, then we have the uh, surface floater that Ulders just presented, uh, like he also alluded to in his um, presentation, high local content, really important in some markets, not so much in other markets, so it's, it's, uh, it depends on, on where we are aiming. <coughs> uh, one of the difficulties with making it work with the uh, with Ulders concept is high acceler accelerations in an SL. We did analysis and we can make it work, it will work. Uh, and that's also the message with, uh, with, uh, with most of the systems that we look at. It can be made to work somehow. It's just a matter of what is the most cost-effective solution. <clears throat> the last one here is uh, the SPA, uh, which Sebastian will talk about later. Main message, proven. We've done it before. It's really simple, straightforward. It works. Disadvantage, you need a lot of water depth to do final assembly. And uh, that's the main drawback of, uh, of this system. But it also means a potential high maintenance cost unless you solve uh, the problem with being able to exchange large equipment. And I know that Statoil is working on that. <coughs> Industrialization is key, we say here. Um, there are two ways of attacking uh, industrialization the way we look at it. You can either go the manufacturing route, saying large factories that will produce large quantities uh, and thereby drive down cost. It requires big investments and it, it also means that you're dependent on the wind market only. Um, what we believe more in is the um, procurement approach, as we call it. It's, I don't know whether procurement approach is the right word, but in lack of better, um, we are looking at areas where we can get moving with a, a limited investment. So looking at factory systems or at factor and pipe systems, for instance, where factories have already been built and paid for, 
Um, and the example that we are using here is spiral welded pipe. Uh, why are we not using spiral welded pipes in jackets as well as in floaters? Well, they are not approved by DNV uh, for that uh, purpose yet, but we don't see why not. Uh, you just have to design so that you can stay within the realms of the, uh, of the size that are limiting. So you can't have pipes here with more than 25 millimeters of wall thickness. So that's the challenge, but that can be solved, at least for some of the pipes. Another advantage with that is that you can get them surface treated extremely cost effective. <clears throat> and share volumes with other industries, that is, these factories are being used by the oil and gas pipeline industry. Uh, they are competing hard against each other, so, uh, so cost levels are really uh, low. <clears throat> and also try to look at, it doesn't have to be local production if it means that the costs are, are much higher. Uh, we have to focus on LCOE. I guess nobody really cares about CapEx, of course, when, uh, in, in some aspects, but what it's all about is LCOE. And if you can find solutions where you can, uh, where you can produce pipes in one area of the world, ship them to another area of the world, and that goes for, for nodes as well, and you can make the LCOE case work, then uh, that's what you have to do. Some of the drivers uh, that we see in uh, balance of plant systems, we have, uh, in, we have on the top line here, we have the cost drivers of today's setup and the cost drivers or cost reductions in tomorrow's setup. Manual welding of nodes, for instance. Here we are talking about weeks of welding time for, for a, a skilled welder. Here we are talking about hours of robot time. We are talking about specialized uh, pipes, spiral welded pipes, I talked about that before. We have offshore specific cab cables with steel reinforcement. Why don't we work with simpler cable types, cable and pipe solutions? We are demonstrating that in a project in Denmark right now. So full scale, um, seven megawatt pr uh, turbines based on uh, where the power is led away through uh, onshore cables in plastic pipes have to move away from assembly in shipyards and over to a more modular assembly line approach where we can assemble jackets and floater structures at a key wall without the investments uh, in, a, in a shipyard. Because we don't think that the market is stable enough to anybody wanting to invest in, in, in shipyard-like structures. <coughs> yeah, and a bit on substation, I'll skip that. Uh, some of the learnings that we have done in, uh, in um, bottom fixed or jacket structures, uh, as you can see on the top line here, this is the projects that we have been and are executing right now. And down here, we can see how can that be transferred into um, to, um, floaters, because we think they can. Could we envisage that we are using cable and pipe solutions for, for floaters? I don't see why not. There's challenges that have to be solved, but I don't see why not. Why don't we learn from robot welded nodes, transfer that directly to, uh, to uh, lattice floater structures. I think that's an easy um, transfer, a knowledge transfer. We have plug and play solution, a, a project that we have, uh, uh, that we have uh, ended now, uh, or it, it not ended, it, it was at the end of, uh, of the planned phase, where we can install um, um, uh, transformers and switch gear at a very fast pace in um, in a turbine booster solution or OGM solution. And why couldn't we transfer that onto floaters? We just have to make sure that the, uh, that the transformer can survive the motions of the floater. Otherwise, we can have a very quick setup process for that as well. Then we have a project on, on buckets we are working on right now. And buckets for a jacket, uh, industrialized buckets can also be used for many of the, um, of the um, uh, floater concepts as well. We have a project now that we, oh, sorry, that we just started with a modularization of a jacket foundation where we will um, be working with modularization. So how to split a jacket into handleable, easy assemble, uh, assemblable uh, sections. That learning can be transferred directly one-to-one -one on a lattice floater structure as well. <clears throat> the last slide here is uh, just a summary. Um, I would like to mention that 
we don't see any specific challenges with most of the concepts that we're looking at as long as they are, uh, that they are utilizing a turbine that has already been developed. Uh, we don't believe that there will be enough market in the next uh, years that to support specially developed turbines. Um, we look at designs that, have, that we can see that has a high level of industrialization potential. Don't, in, uh, don't look at one-off solutions in terms of, uh, of factory setups, in terms of installation vessels, and in terms of, uh, of turbine types. Utilize something that is in the market already. And then think big. Uh, the solutions that we're looking at uh, for plus 2025 will be very big projects, so it doesn't help that we have a concept where we can, if we squeeze it, produce 50 units per year. We have to go much higher than that for it in order to make the, uh, the economics work. And last but not least, think solutions that are easy to scale to, turbo to larger turbines because the turbine development will not stop at where we are right now. So we have to find solutions that are easy to scale. Yes, that's it for me. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> I want to um, talk about three things today. I want to talk a little bit of why Statoil believes in, in, in the floating and, and why we're in this space. I want to show you some exciting uh, news from uh, our project uh, uh, in, uh, in Scotland, Highway in Scotland. And then I want to talk about uh, opportunity, opportunities and the challenges and how we want to tackle them. So I'm, uh, I'm heading up the, the Highway development team, which is looking at exactly those challenges uh, for, for Statoil. Okay, very brief. Uh, roughly two years ago, Statoil uh, uh, decided to establish uh, a unit called New Energy Solution. Irene was here earlier talking about it, and I think in short, it's, it's a two-folded mandate. It's a build a profitable, renewable business, and it is to, to look for low-carbon uh, opportunities uh, for our core products. I'm not going to go in-depth on, on, on the strategy, but that's the kind of backdrop for, for, for this. And then I think we, we need to have some exciting news. So almost streaming live from Stord in, in, uh, in Norway. I hope this will work. Okay, so basically that was live from, uh, from Stord, uh, and this summer we will um, do the mating and we will ship the high wind to, to Scotland, and it will be on stream this year. So I think it's, it's important to, to acknowledge that this is the first floating wind park uh, coming on stream, and we are extremely excited to, uh, to, to see that, and, and, and we'll of course follow and learn from it closely. I'll come back to it a bit later. But um, uh, in brief, the portfolio, Statoil is no, no longer an oil and gas company. We're an energy company. And we have a growing portfolio within the offshore wind. And I think the kind of strength of, of playing on bottom fixed combined with floating and utilizing the experience will be key for us. We'll, we'll also kind of marrying the oil and gas, of course, and, and the oil and gas experience and, and, and knowledge. And I think we're... Our capabilities of, of, uh, of, of offshore and, and being a global uh, offshore player for, for over 40 years uh, will give us an advantage to both understand the challenges we face, but also to, to, to uh, utilize the opportunities. 
And of course, a lot of suppliers here today, I hope, and, and that is a key thing for us, how to work with, with you as supplier to, to solve the challenges mentioned, and I will come back to more of them later. Okay, so it, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because both uh, Ole and the others uh, mentioned it, but we, we see uh, a, a virtually uh, unlimited resources and potential for floating. Uh, and, and I think the market is, uh, is, uh, is there. You have Japan, you have US, you have Europe, and, and, and it's just a question of when and how. Uh, and to actually look at both, the combi or both floating as, as a next step to, to bottom fix, but also to look, as Ole mentioned, as, as an alternative or something else. So don't limit it to be just the next step, but it's also uh, uh, something, something new, which can actually access new markets, which bottom fix can't. The ability to standardize the foundation will be key to industrialize the production, and, and we think the SPAR concept we have is, is an excellent opportunity to do that. You don't need to, to, to customize this for any, any uh, as you have to do for, for, for the bottom fixed. Okay, challenges has been, been mentioned, and they're there. And, and let's not, let's not uh, fool ourselves and say that this is straightforward. Three key challenges that we need to solve, and we need to solve them as a, in, a holistic, in a holistic way, I believe. It's, it's the cost, it's there. We had a cost reduction from our pilot to our demo, to, to our, um, sorry, from our uh, demonstration to our pilot with a roughly 60 to 70%. And we are seeing another 40 to 50% potential from, uh, from, from uh, Highway in Scotland to the next project. So it is, is its considerable uh, cost reduction potentials. Okay, to do that, you need deployment. Obviously, we have the, the demo and the pilot park, but we need the next step. And what will that be? We need another commercial bigger park than Highway in Scotland as, as the next step to be able to, to start the journey of the cost reduction. And then, of course, as, uh, as, as mentioned before here, the concept development and the technology development need to happen. There need to be innovation. And how do we tackle that? How do we approach this? I think it's a, it's, it's a simple and a very complex answer to it. The simple answer is, is collaboration, uh, and, and that is critical. And I think that just, just the four of us up here shows that that, that is happening as we speak. We are, we are seeing the same, and, and, and we will collaborate to, to, to meet the, the challenges. And I think the, the key triangle here, where we have a kind of a risk-reward sharing in, in the middle, will be, be crucial for, for the development. If, if the, the, the customer, governments, if, if the supplier industry and the developers like Satoil are able to sit down and work this together uh, and actually do the real risk and share, re risk reward sharing, we, we will have an opportunity to, uh, to, to solve it. I'll come back to a little bit where, where I think the different uh, elements will be in it. We have, in a way, illustrated that through our Hive in Scotland project. And, uh, and I think the, the fact that the Scottish government and the UK government uh, made the site available, made the, the support mechanism for doing it, and actually helped through the concession process, et cetera, et cetera, made that smooth, was an very important uh, uh, key factor for us to succeed. And then we have, so, not really working here. Ah, oh, there we go. So from a customer perspective, in this case, UK Scottish government, the collaboration between the parties was, was, was key for us to identify and make available the site. It was a lean process and it, it needs to be uh, uh, predictable and, and the permits and concession process needs to be, be, be transparent uh, for, for both the developer and the supply industry to, to move on it. And then the support mechanism needs to be to, to accelerate uh, the development. This is not necessarily a non-competitive one. You can, you can have competition in here. That's not the problem, but, but you need some kind of support mechanism in that competition 
to, to, to kickstart it. So from a supplier's perspective, how can the suppliers contribute? I think we, we, you see the map here is a kind of, a, I'm not going to go in details on all of it, but, but there is a wide variety of suppliers to the Highway in Scotland project. And that, that has been a very, it's been a lot of, of interest and focus from suppliers to, to who wants to contribute. And I think the, to, to continue that uh, appetite for us is key and, and, and to even uh, streamline and, and show how we can industrialize the next project through supplier cooperation and do innovation together with the supplier will be, as I said from Siemens as well, extremely uh, important in that process. Here you see the, 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 the shipping or the, the substructure outside the Stord. So from a developer side, we, we can do what we do today. We can take the risk, we can be the, the integrator and, and, and we will work on this. And I think it, it lies in a responsibility to, for us to, to really work on, on, on how the collaboration can be structured. And, and we really hope that, um, that we are able to attract uh, the supply industry to, to come with ideas, to stimulate to innovation, uh, but also to think about innovation as industrialization and and, and standardization. <clears throat> so, in short, we have an invitation for the supply industry and, of course, our customers to, to together with Statoil, develop the high wind concept. And as a last uh, remark here, I, I think, uh, obviously, Statoil believes in our high wind concept, but, but we equally think it's important that the floating industry is growing. So, so we will not limit ourselves to, 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 uh, to, to only our, our high wind uh, spar concept and, and we believe that the market development is equally important as, uh, as uh, high wind as a special concept. We believe it's a large potential and, and, and the cost and technology will be solved if we're, if we're able to, to, to utilize the, the, tri the triangle and risk sharing. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone for excellent presentations and for so a lot of innovative ideas and development. And there's, there's two elements I think we see here. There's in one particularly, we need floating wind to, to grow our market. And this, as Giles Dixon mentioned on the first day, 60 gigawatts in Europe by 2030 is an ambitious target of sorts. And it's not going to get there just through fixed bottom installation. You'll have to have floating as well. The other conundrum we're at the moment is that we, we talk about zero subsidy and we can have a debate about what that really means. Uh, if we're comparing apples and bananas and apples and apples with, uh, with actually what is a fixed uh, bottom structure and is it really totally subsidy free. But that does leave floating wind with a much higher cost, uh, level cost of energy. Um, again, we're talking about deployment here versus R&D. I think maybe a, a question probably maybe for, for Jesper to think about this is the, the deployment that we've seen has been driving innovation, particularly on the turbine side, and it's reduced the levelized cost of energy. And we've seen upgrades and upgrades the whole time there. Where, where do we see elements of deployment? Where, how can we capture more deployment for floating wind to actually drive the innovation needed uh, to take big scale projects? There's a microphone there. Well, I think I, I mentioned some of the, uh, the aspects there that, um, that we have to look at, not just the, the structure, we also have to look at the other elements of uh, balance of plant in, uh, in order to, to drive down the uh, LCOE. But again, I think it, it is all about learning from, uh, from the uh, innovations that we are doing in, uh, in bottom fixed uh, right now, and that goes for, for uh, monopiles as well as uh, the upcoming uh, jacket uh, innovations that we are working on, and the whole industry is working on. Others from the panel, we could think of more about the, how to get the deployment, any policy, if you had a policy ask and you had any European Union commissioners or any to the British government, they're, they're doing other things today. Um, any ideas there on the policy side? Um, fairly obvious. Um, a young technology can't compete with um, other technologies, established technologies on the same basis. So there needs to be uh, support mechanisms in place. Uh, we see that with the CFD mechanism. The UK government has a CFD support system, but it is all for, uh, I think, less established technologies, which um, packs monopile-based uh, offshore uh, wind farms into the same package as innovative single-unit uh, 
floaters, and that's impossible to realize. We can't compete with that. Um, so there need to be special mechanisms, um, be it in, in the UK or in France or anywhere. Thank you. Should we open up to the floor now for if you'd like to raise your hand? We have folks with microphones ready and waiting. There's a question here. Thank you. Um, in, on your slide, uh, you s there was um, tilt angle less than 10 degrees. I guess this might be a design limit. I'm not sure uh, if you can clarify. And also to ask, um, what is the maximum um, tilt you expect during operation? And what is the average tilt angle? So uh, during normal operation, um, the maximum tilt angle uh, which supposed to uh, we have is 10 degrees, but we can allow a tilt angle of uh, 15 degrees uh, during extreme operation. You expect 10 degrees? Yes, and this has been proven already with uh, the numerical model and also with the tank tests. Thank you. We have a question just in the middle here. Good morning, I have a question for Sabrina too. I'm Maurizio Collo from Cranfield University. Uh, you have shown the installation uh, phase of the tailwind and with the telescopic tower and uh, the lowering of the lower uh, tank. Can you clarify how long more or less does it take and under which condition is possible to perform this operation in terms of significant wave height and wind speed? You mean how long the installation? Yeah, take? how long uh, uh, that operation of having the telescopic tower raised and the tank lowered and the mooring system attached and under which significant wave height wind speed, more or less you can do that? I must admit that I was not involved in uh, the definition and specification of uh, the installation process, but I would like to invite you uh, to come uh, here after the... Um, after the session, and uh, then we can have a talk with uh, Jose Serna, also from Esteco, uh, and he can explain more about this. Thank you very much. Question over here in the middle. Hi, my name is Kun Hermans from ECN. I have a question uh, to Jesper from uh, Siemens. Um, what is your view on the tow out operation with the turbine pre installed, considering the accelerations in the nacelle? That's the uh, main. Uh, way of doing it in in all of the, uh, the concepts, maybe with a small difference in the uh, Statoil uh, high wind concept. Otherwise, that's the main solution uh, that in all of the concepts we're looking at. So we are, of course, perfectly fine with that. And also acknowledge that there is a lot of um, testing we can do in port before we uh, we drag out the turbine. So that will be fine, fine with us. Okay. Great to see it happening. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> Over here. A question for Statoil. First, uh, congratulations. What you are doing is really impressive. Nice to see this movie. Very exciting. And uh, I believe this is with this type of movie that we will also uh, contribute to this market. Question maybe for you, Stephen. How do you see um, the volumes uh, to come for floating wind? Uh, and uh, how can we uh, get there to, uh, to reach the, the target and deploy this floating wind market? For you, Stephen, maybe? Oh, me? Oh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm allowed to speak since I'm the uh, chair. But <laughs> I, think, uh, I think Sebastian, you can answer that on the volume side of the, of the, of the question. Uh, obviously, the volumes are, are, are low now at, at, at the moment. And I don't think I, you saw some, some uh, 2025 was shown here. I, I, I think it's more about getting, getting this going. And, and get the next project and start the, the journey for industrialization and, and cost reduction here. So um, I, I will be very, uh, I, I can't speculate on, on, on volumes in, in, in the time to come, but I think our ambition is, is, is to always have the next project a little bit bigger uh, because you, you learn more, you, you, will, uh, you will kind of expand the, the, the knowledge and, and you will be able to, to mobilize supply industry, etc. So. Uh, hopefully as big as possible. It's a good question. Let's just follow up a little bit on that one and put the panel on the spot. 
So which country would be the first one out with a 150 megawatt wind park for a floating? Start with you, Ola. And don't say Switzerland. <laughs> 150 megawatts, hmm, Japan. Okay. okay, thank you. Yes, Ben? Then I'll be different and I'll say Taiwan. Taiwan okay, Sabrina? So I thought that France would be the first country. <laughs> Sebastian? So, U Uda, I see you make notes. I say Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, okay, thank you. Next questions, one over here and then one at the front afterwards. Hi, Chas Bradbury from Petrofac. Um, as the projects get larger, um, I see there's been a lot of research and development on individual turbines and individual turbine foundations and things. But I'm not seeing very much on the actual substations which will be needed, which will have their own issues such as dynamic high voltage uh, export cables or trying to keep uh, the movements on the electrical equipment so just a general question, really, um, to see, the, uh, are you actually looking into substation designs for floating offshore, and what do you think the major issues are with those? Yeah, um, I can answer that. We're looking into that. I cannot answer with whom, but um, it's um, significant players. So um, we see the issue, and we're addressing it, and we're cooperating with the, the usual suspects. I can give a quick take on that as well. Um, I think I showed you a sneak view on, um, on our OTM solution, which is a solution where we can place a relatively large transformer on a turbine, um, where we can have up to 250, 270 megawatt on, um, on this one structure. Um, and I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work on a floater. Uh, we just have to find ways of making the uh, transformer manufacturers accept that it actually does move and that they design the winding system so they can't move around on the yoke of the transformer but it's a matter of, uh, of design because it can be done in, uh, in mobility so why couldn't it be done here so I think it's a very low practical thing that can be solved easily Another question in the front up here uh, Good morning my name is Gary Ross from CPD Systems um, I noticed all the concepts employ horizontal axis turbines and from a floating point of view as you scale up a vertical turbine would make more sense for the stability of the floating unit what's blockage for developing vertical axis turbine technology maybe one for Jesper well the main blockage in that is that we have uh, more than 30 years of experience in uh, in in developing horizontal axis turbines. And uh, this is what we do. This is what our organization is tuned in to do. Uh, and we've seen many attempts on, on pursuing vertical axis turbines. And we haven't really seen any progressing apart from smaller scale uh, household-like turbines. Uh, so maybe it could be done. It probably shouldn't be done by us. It should be done by somebody else. And we think that it would be hard for the vertical axis industry to keep up because the development is going really, really fast on vertical axis, uh, sorry, on horizontal axis uh, turbines. So it's a moving target, and I'm not sure that they will ever uh, be able to keep up. Another question here? Thank yeah, another question. In line to this uh, previous question, Alain and Chipex from Elfi, would you see a limit to the size of horizontal axis floating turbines? I hope you're not asking me to uh, answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the basic question is, will uh, turbines become bigger? Yes, of course they will. Is there a limit? Uh, I don't know. We predicted with, in the company that I come from, at least twice over the years, we predicted now turbines can't be bigger. We cannot transport them. The blades are too long. The, uh, they are too heavy to, uh, to transport around. And boy, were we wrong. We made that mistake many years ago when we had our 450 kV turbine. Then we made the mistake again at a later point. I can't remember which size we did it. And uh, now we stopped predicting because we cannot predict it. <coughs> Sabrina, did you have a comment? Yeah, 
Yeah, I think uh, what we have seen in the past and also uh, what um, was presented by MHG Vestas was that uh, loads are really incredibly increasing with the size of uh, the rotor blade. That's why uh, MHI Vesta stayed with a relatively low rotor size uh, with their 9.5 megawatt turbine. So uh, I have the feeling that there is a limit, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't know where this will be. Thank you. Um, other questions? It's over here, thank you. Darius Aram from DTU. Um, I can see a lot of people are interested in making uh, floating wind energy happen, and I'm happy to see that. What kind of uh, educational efforts are planned today and in the near future to make it happen? And that's a question to anybody in this room, just more experienced colleagues. Thank you. So educational efforts, um, I think you can take a broad brush approach to the team. I think we have 60 engineers um, designing floating wind uh, substructures and none of them has studied floating wind substructures. They all come from established other parts like uh, naval architecture, uh, marine engineering, oil and gas, um, where floating has been a state of the art technology for 30 years. So um, there isn't really anything new uh, that needs to be uh, done in terms of education. What's new is, uh, is computer models um, for coupled analysis, but that is under development at the moment. I don't think that can be captured by educational efforts because like any computational technology that is um, for uh, computer nerds really. Others from the panel? Yeah, maybe a quick comment on that. We, uh, we are always aiming for working with uh, universities in the work that we do on developing uh, new concepts that will also work for floaters. So I mentioned five different projects up there and they are all done somehow in conjunction with, uh, with different universities. So interaction with universities in, in development work is extremely important for us and also in the future on when we start having more streamlined projects with pure focus on floaters, it will also be together with universities, including DTU as well. Maybe not answering your question fully, but, but obviously we, we're playing on our strengths from the oil and gas and the offshore. Uh, but, but, but I think one thing I, I reflected on is, is where is it useful to use that competence and, and where do you need to build new competence? Because some of it or a lot of it is, is, uh, is actually uh, mergeable, but some of it is actually not. Uh, and, and one of them can be how, how you work with supplier industry, for instance. So, so we need to think about and rethink about how we structure this to, to combine the deployment and the cost part. And that will require new competence and, and new, maybe new business models around floating compared to, for instance, oil and gas at least. Sabrina, did you have a comment? Yes, one thing I would like to add is uh, that I think that uh, communication is a uh, competence which we all will need uh, to collaborate because there are a lot of people working together with very different expertise and the one who is developing the mooring lines also needs to understand which dynamics are coming from the wind turbine and uh, we see this in our development project right now and I think this is uh, very important and this needs to be stimulated in projects. Okay, thank you. We're running out of time here so we have just for one more question. No, then I'm going to hit the, the team with them. I asked you which country, okay, which year, which year do we expect bottom fixed and floating wind to merge? Ola, which year do you think to be, to be but we say, we could say floating to be competitive with bottom fixed or maybe the other way around, but what, what year do we see the spread between levelized cost of energy between bottom fixed and floating? Um, I, I skipped over the slide from Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which shows that for the US they've done extensive calculations and they expect to see uh, the break even in 2027. 2027. Okay. It's, I mean, there's a huge bandwidth of uncertainty around it. Uh, mm. my, my guess is uh, in Europe we'll have commercial floating wind farms um, before 2025 and I'd be optimistic we'll start with 2023. Thank you, British statement. Other comments or ideas? Well, I'm maybe less optimistic on that part. Um, I think we will, we will have to go beyond 25 before we see that. 
And I also think that uh, I noticed that you all and heard that before that uh, that bottom fixed and floaters are not in competition with each other. They are definitely they are in competition. Uh, the difference is, of course, that some places you have better wind, but that also leads to to higher production, thereby lower LCOE. So the LCOE level is where the competition is. That's what's important. And and if you're an investor, you will always go for the lowest LCOE. That's how it is. And if, it, if that is in competition with a bottom fix, then you have the opportunity to buy a bottom fix wind farm with a lower LCOE, then you will do it as an investor. Sabrina? Yeah, I think it's really depending on the site. So uh, uh, as uh, Jesper has mentioned, it's not about only CAPEX, but also LCOE. So if we are further from, from shore, then uh, we have also longer time for, uh, maintaining an for maintaining an installation. So uh, um, I do not know if you can really compare a site which is uh, far uh, offshore with a site which is uh, near shore uh, with, fixed, uh, uh, with fixed foundation. So, um. Sebastian? Yeah. I, I think if you look at this industry and, and bottom fixed, uh, you, you have had some surprises the last year or so. So I would be surprised if we don't have another surprise or several to go. So uh, I leave it at that. And then I think we, we are ready to, to, to move to the next level for uh, Harbin. Thank you. Before I thank the panel, I'd just like to say a little advert for Renewable UK. There will be a conference exclusively on floating wind in the autumn. We haven't decided the date yet. So make sure you're on Renewable UK website or, or join Renewable UK, especially if you're a supply chain vendor out there for, for a discount. And then there will have, and, and Stella will be also posting a lot up of information up there and we'll have our opening in uh, of, uh, of High Wind Scotland in 18th of October. So we're looking forward to that. Thanks so much to the panel, excellent discussion and appreciate everyone's time as well today. Thank you.